Okay, everybody saw me press the button. Kevin can't tell me off afterwards if I've done it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you for coming to the uh, Drew's Q and A. Um, can you hear hear me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, um, can we hear Drees? That's that's good. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. I'm Rachel Larson from the Drupal Association, and I seem to have done this session at DrupalCon a few times now. I'm starting to get into the flow of it. Um. So, I wanted to try and ask some questions, ask some yeah. sort of fun ones, ask some hard-hitting ones, right, and yeah. uh, see how we go. But yeah. mainly, all of the questions are driven by you, the audience, and I hope that I can move around the screen and ask people in the room to stand up and ask their question when it comes on the list. If that's possible, if you don't want to, just let me know and I'll ask it for you. Okay. So, and they're all behind us. And they're all behind us, and I'll, I'll choose them as we go. I can see them, I don't know what they are. Oh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to start off with uh, something else. So, some weeks ago, you uh, came home from the office after having had quite a big day at the office at Acquia. Uh, you had managed to secure a deal. Mm -hmm. uh, selling a major part of Acquia to Vistra, their massive investment there. Quite a big day. Yeah. And you came home, and apparently you ordered a Chinese takeaway <laughs> and collapsed on the sofa. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the question on my lips and probably everybody else's is, what did you have? Uh. <laughs> Funny. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer that question in a second. So I actually live in an apartment, which is um, takes me an hour and twenty minutes to get home um, from from Aquia, which is in, in Boston in the city. And so by the time I get home on like long days, I'm just like ready to like you know sit down. And anyway, so I did. Uh, we went on, we went for takeout food. It was Chinese food. Uh, I always order the same thing. It's pretty boring. Uh, but it's the fried rice with vegetables, <laughs> and then there's a spicy chicken, and they add a lot of chili peppers to it, so it's like really nice and spicy. And uh, I can I can eat it for two days actually. It's so much food that I it, I eat it for two days in a row. So that's what I did. It's delicious. It's easy. Okay. Not like healthy. Um. Actually, I'm going to ask another one that was on here, and in fact, actually, I think we've had this before. Which was, um, we have the Imami demo. Mm -hmm. Have you ever cooked anything on the Imami demo? Uh, <laughs> no, but I want to. Actually, I want some of my photos in the Imami demo. And so, ah. first I need to help cook something. Usually, the sous chef at home, I'll be honest. Like, Vanessa and I, we cook together quite a bit, but she's definitely the, the main chef. And uh, I'm the sous chef, so I, I do cutting and dishes and all that kind of stuff. But um, we actually set out to create a cookbook. It's one of our goals is to, because I love photography, I like making photos or taking photos of, of things, and so one of our goals is to make a cookbook and to publish it, but just for friends and family kind of publishing, but uh, maybe I can contribute a recipe to... Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. that would be really good. Have to also contribute it in Spanish now. Uh, yeah, it'll be a little bit harder for me, but... <laughs> and get some help with that. Yeah, yeah. so ju jumping back a little bit, uh, so we've talked about food, mm -hmm. uh, which is always close to my heart, uh, but thinking back to acquisitions, mm -hmm. how do you feel about Adobe's acquisition of Magento? Wow, that's a while ago. Um, I think it's, I mean, at the time I wrote a long blog post about it. Um, not sure if you saw it or not, but um, it was a bit of a strange acquisition for me because they're so enterprise focused and Magento was sort of mid market. They historically have the DNA of kind of screwing up open source too, a little bit. <laughs> Adobe, so I was a little bit skeptical about what would happen with Magento, and it's still not entirely clear to me how Magento is doing as part of um, Adobe. Um, you guys may have a better finger on the pulse there, but I thought it was a little bit unusual. Um, like for me, the e-commerce space, maybe more broadly, 
is, is an interesting space because um, there's so many different systems and so many different needs, and there's not really one e-commerce platform that you could acquire as Adobe that would kind of fill all the needs of all of the e-commerce situations. So I, I'm not sure if I'm a, I'm a big believer in sort of the, the one e-commerce platform to rule them all. Um, and so I think of Magento as great for like mid-market related things, but like some very large customers have like such unique needs, like um, very deep uh, point of sale integration. Like if you have a lot of physical stores, you want your, what is it called, your cashier system mm -hmm. to be integrated to all your warehouses, your fulfillment centers. Like Magento, to the best of my knowledge, isn't really the best solution for these very complex uh, situations, which I would imagine are a lot of Adobe's customers. So, um, I don't know. And it's tough because by buying, actually one of the things that we saw at Acquia <coughs> is like the day they announced um, the acquisition of, of Magento, like almost every independent e-commerce vendor knocked on our door. <laughs> And uh, they said, hey, we would like to have a strategic partnership with you because uh, like, we don't want to work with Adobe anymore. Like, they just bought Magento, and so why would we try and work with Adobe because they're probably going to try and you know, replace us eventually with Magento. And so it's been interesting, yeah. actually. Like, I feel like um, I mean, I'm putting my Acquia head on here, but like, a, a lot of our competitors, Sidecore Adobe, they all have a native commerce solution, and in a way, um, you know, Drupal, while we have the Drupal Commerce Project, it, it doesn't have, it, 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 I think it's perceived by a lot of these commerce vendors as being sort of um, like a neutral platform that they can really partner with, which I think is, is pretty exciting for Drupal. And that's what we see, too. Like, I know of Drupal sites that are integrated with Hybris and uh, ATG and IBM WebSphere Commerce and Salesforce Commerce Cloud and obviously Magento 2, um, Elastic Path Commerce Tools. Like Drupal has all of these integrations, um, you know, and, and that's a real strength. So, and so I'm kind of giving a long-winded answer here, but like the acquisition of Magento by Adobe actually could be good for Drupal, you know. Oh. So it's funny actually, yeah. Adobe seems to be coming up a lot in uh, the questions that are posted. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming Null isn't actually somebody's name here. Uh, <laughs> people are asking, um, Null is asking, how would you sell Drupal in comparison to Adobe Experience Manager? Key mm. selling points, that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I would highlight the open source nature of Drupal um, and what that means, right? Open source is just that. but. Open source done well, there's a thriving community. And that thriving community results in a lot of innovation, uh, modules, themes, uh, integrations. Uh, and I think that's a real selling point. And so you combine these benefits of open source all the way from you're not shackled by uh, a proprietary vendor and the APIs that they provide. You can do whatever you dream. Actually, you can implement with Drupal. And you can do it faster, and you can do it with Adobe. Ooh, it's getting cozy. <laughs> and then um, you can really benefit from sort of our collective efforts as a community. So it's cheaper, it's faster, it's better. Um, you know, I think on the CMS side, there's very little. Um, like it's it's easy to beat Adobe just on the Experience Manager side. I think the only thing. Um, that could be better is the usability um, of, of Drupal. But usually when Adobe wins, it's because they come, they have like a bigger suite of products. You know? ah, so okay. that, that's where they have the upper hand, I would say. So talking about bigger suites of top of products, I can't speak today. Uh, given Drupal's move mm -hmm. towards uh, a better beginner experience, uh, low code or no code, Things like Cohesion DX. Uh, this is Deepen's question, and I should have asked if he was here. I do apologise. No. Uh, how do you see the Drupal workforce, us? Mm -hmm. How do you see the workforce and the agency ecosystem evolving? Yeah, it's a great question. And by the way, there's a few seats in the front here if anyone wants to come up and sit down. You don't have to. Um, but um, I mean, first of all. 
you know, this is a multi-decade trend. We move to low code, no code. I mean, it's nothing new. And whether Drupal gets into it or not is almost irrelevant for how um, sort of the, the ecosystem will evolve. Um, if you think about it, you know, go back in time 10 years, uh, content management systems were a lot more manual. <laughs> Today, um, you know, there's a lot more drag and drop. There's a lot more WYSIWYG, which is what people usually um, refer to when they say low code, no code. And it's really what customers want, what users want, right? They want to do more with less. They want to go faster. They want to, you know, create these pages, landing pages, what have you. They want to do it really quickly. So um, looking at it from the other way, it's like we have to do that. Like, if we, if we don't become more low code, no code, we're going to lose. And so there's actually no choice for us to invest in those things in my mind. And yes, as a result, you know, how we work um, and what we do for our customers will evolve and change. But that's been evolving and changing for like 20 years, right? Like the original web developer literally wrote HTML in a text file not FTP'd it. <laughs> right, yeah, just straight up FTP to a server and that was building a website. And so in many ways today, there's already a lot more low code, no code compared to 10 years and 20 years ago. And they're just gonna accelerate. And just like we're not doing these things anymore, like FTP today, hopefully. <laughs> um, maybe some of us still. Um, I think our role will evolve and we'll do more complex things and different kinds of things. And I see what I what I see a lot of what I see a lot more of is these complex integrations. Like again, ten years ago a website was a standalone application. You know, it didn't really integrate with much else. And today it's not unusual to see a website, a Drupal site, integrated with ten systems, from email marketing systems to support systems, to commerce systems, like yeah. we talked about, to CRM systems, to all these things, CDNs for performance. And so I think you'll we'll see the role of agencies and Drupal shops evolving, like, you know, building bigger marketing platforms almost versus just simple websites and doing a lot of work around integrations. And then hopefully the, the marketers and the content creators can just you know create pages themselves, so that we don't have to do that anymore. So anyway, long answer again, but it's like you know, world is changing with or without this. <laughs> and uh, we better change with this world in my mind. And that's what we're doing. Like we're investing heavily in this, and I showed that a little bit yesterday in my keynote, all the way from the layout builder initiative, the media initiative. We're really trying to make Drupal more low code, especially for. Um, the non-developers. Yeah. It's, it's funny actually, the, it follows quite nicely onto the next question in terms of so many of the, like we have quite a big portion, proportion of the current and proposed initiatives mm -hmm. that are based around the user experience, right. uh, which is great. How can we look to increase the size of our user experience community to help build more momentum there, get some bodies? Yeah. It's interesting, like it's a hard question and we've struggled for, with this for a long time because if you think about the Drupal ecosystem, a lot of you, you work at digital agencies or Drupal shops and <coughs> design and user experience is often like a core competency of what you do, it's what you do for a lot of your customers. I mean, it depends on, on the organization, but often, and somehow we haven't managed to get more of those people to contribute. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, I think we need to help foster that community. I think maybe we can provide more structure around it. Um, and, you know, the same is true like for other areas like marketing. I know it's a little bit of a jump, but like if you think about what we did with developers, it's amazing. It's unbelievable that we managed to get 10,000 developers to collaborate on a piece of software. Like think about that, like, and we do it through online, through tools and issue queues, and with all these processes and, and you know systems Ooh. and testing systems. Like it's pretty remarkable. <laughs> it's like Microsoft scale software development, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then somehow we aren't able to replicate that in, in sort of adjacent, um, you know, um, disciplines. 
whether it's marketing, like why can't we all collaborate on marketing? Like imagine we built those systems just like we did for developers. Or imagine, to answer your question, we built the systems to get hundreds of user experience people to, to really collaborate and come together. It would be pretty magical. <laughs> well, I hope we're um, making a start on that now. Yeah. Things like the pitch deck and... Yeah, we're starting to get better. Yeah, we launched the Promote Drupal initiative a while yeah. ago and we created a space for people to come together. That, that's more on the marketing side, but I think it's a huge opportunity for us to uh, kind of think about how do we set up the same sort of systems optimized for these audiences to really collaborate. And, um, yeah, that's an area where we yeah. we should definitely invest. I think we have a strong technical profile. Yeah, we, we have a very... So maybe it's also a kind yeah. of barrier for marketing stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, we are very technical, and I, I, I take a lot of the blame yeah. for that. Because, <laughs> um, you know, Drupal was started by developers for developers. Yeah. Literally. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that's deep in our DNA, right? So we need to break out of that, and yeah. we need to find ways to get... Um, replicate our successes outside of just the developer world, and we should think about tooling. You know, like, I don't know what the, rest, the best tool is for this, but um, I'm sure there's tools that designers want to use, and that we can scale to hundreds of designers. I don't know, but um, I'm not a designer myself. But for those of you in the room, if you have ideas, uh, we'd love to learn more about them. Yeah, I think actually this next question from Patrick Knox kind of helps solidify that a little bit. Is Patrick here? It's me. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> are you okay if I read it out rather than yeah, no crawling problem. in the cross? Uh, what is the biggest roadblock that you see right now? Um, mm. Rather than if, if it's not something currently, maybe something historically? Ro roadblock to success for Drupal? Yeah, I think yeah. success. I think that's yeah, what you yeah. mean, yeah. At the end of the day, for me, everything comes down to people. Um, you know, having the right people um, part of our community and having them in the right seats where they can really drive change. Um, and so if I think about how do we grow and how do we get better, it's about, it's really all about people. Um, more diverse people, you know, representation from different, um, you know, groups and geographies and uh, personas, you know, like we just talked about. And then really empowering them to to become leaders in our community and to set up the systems and the processes to help um, to attract others to contribute as well. And so, um, you know, it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, I wrote this super long blog post that I mentioned <laughs> in my keynote makers and, about makers and bakers, but it's you know I, I articulated in that post really well. But I, I think. It's funny, open source is like 20 years old, and we know how to collaborate on code, um, but we haven't really figured out how to scale open source beyond just development, and we haven't really figured out how to make it truly sustainable in a healthy way. And, like, and when I say truly sustainable in a healthy way, I'm thinking like, how do we make sure that open source and Drupal is around in 50 years, in 100 years. And how do we make sure that we're winning? Right, and winning in my mind means going from maybe 40 full-time contributors to 400 full-time contributors, right? Because, um, you know, that's what we're competing against often. It's like these very large organizations and they're getting larger, not smaller. So that's a hard problem. And I think for open source in general, probably the biggest thing to figure out in the next five years. And there's obviously a lot of heated discussions around around that topic, not necessarily in Drupal, but like around other open source organizations and companies changing their license and you know doing all these things to try and figure out the, the model, right? The, the, the business model of open source. Um, and I don't mean that just in a commercial sense, but like the, the sustainability model of open source is so important to figure out and like in my mind so many big things could be solved with open source hmm? like there is a whole category of huge problems in the world that no <coughs> commercial entity or no, no corporate organization will ever inspire to solve literally like yeah there's so many examples like like we really need to reinvent parts of the web in my mind to, to be you know more open um, and, and to really uh, keep it independent 
and to make it better. And like no company is going to wake up in the morning and say, hey, let's rebuild this thing. <laughs> it's, we're only going to do that through open source. Right? That's how we built the infrastructure of the web. And, um, but that's also why we need to be able to innovate really efficiently and in a healthy way and in a sustainable way. Um, because our future depends on it, in my mind. And I know that's a little bit more broadly, but the same thing applies to Drupal. Right? Like how do we make the Drupal project very sustainable, very diverse, with representation from everyone, not just developers. And I, I love that topic, but it's a tough one. It's a yeah. hard problem to solve, obviously. But Absolutely. But it's all about people as well. It's, people. it's very much about people. So Matthew S has asked a question about what kind of metrics do you think that we should gather and how should we weigh contributions in the new community recognition program? Because that's one of the things yeah. that we do need to do to keep those people with us. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, there's many ways to contribute, and we need to recognize all of the ways people can contribute. So obviously there's code, but there's also design, user experience testing, documentation writing, event organizing, serving on local boards of associations all around the world. I mean, there's probably a hundred ways to contribute, and, and the credit system um, that we have, obviously, has been very biased towards code contributions. And so we're actively expanding that, and, and actually groups in the community are starting to use the credit system for non-code contribution as well. So some of the events, um, like Drupal Europe, as an example, last year they started giving each other credit uh, in issues on Drupal.org for non-engineering work, if you will. And so that's really awesome to see that we're starting to, to expand all of those things. So finding ways to really track everything that we do and then recognize the contribution is really important because it often incentivizes people to contribute, right? Like there's a lot of different reasons why people do what they do, but recognition and feeling a sense of, of sort of yeah, recognition is important for, for many. I'm not saying it's important for all, but being able to do that is, is key. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think Again, this is a great example of where Drupal is leading. There's literally no other open source project that has a credit system like us. And um, it's not perfect, but we're like trailblazers, right? Like we're, Absolutely. We're, we're paving the path and others are looking at us. I'm like, how are you guys doing this? It's amazing. How, like the number of emails that I get from people asking like, wow, how, how, how did Drupal manage to get so many people to contribute? Um, you know, we're in a very special situation and I think we can extend that leadership. And so that's why this committee, I think, is so so exciting because they're gonna like take that work that we did, this, that early experimentation work almost, and hopefully extend it to be a much bigger program, a more well-rounded program. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I think we can experiment with that too and we can, we can dial it as needed, for example, we can use credits to basically promote um, people or organizations. We can say, you know what, fixing critical bugs is a little bit more important than fixing non-critical bugs. And so we, we create a little bit more visibility for that. Or we can say, yeah, we really need more user experience people. We can say, wow, usability contributions are maybe valued more than these other kinds of contributions by the credit system, right? And so it actually could be a pretty interesting tool to drive um, the project um, to where it needs to go. Cool. It's funny actually because the, I I uh, I know they've been in the DrupalCon EUR project on Drupal.org. They've been recording uh, issues and credits for virtually everything. Speakers, volunteers, and everyone's been doing here, and it's been marvelous. Even to the point where I've been asked after this session if anybody who has asked the question. I have an issue in the issue queue that I, that we can credit you for asking the question in this room. Which is kind of brilliant. Go. So that's fantastic. See me afterwards. Um, you did talk about how when well, we're talking about people, we need the widest variety of people from all around the world, from the, all the different backgrounds. Uh, and we, we do talk, and we have talked in, in Drew's notes before and, and in these sessions before about how DNI is important to the growth of Drupal. It's absolutely essential. Should it be an official initiative? Would that get more people in the room 
the more people invested in the mm. concept. It's interesting, yeah. The question is, should it be an official initiative? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I, would be, um, I mean, I think, first of all, I think it's really important that we focus on this. And that we should have programs and initiatives around it. Um, and it's been really nice to see the leadership of the um, DDNI team over the years to really push different initiatives and programs and even push me uh, to do more things. And so I think a lot of things are working and I think we're getting better. Um, supported by data, for example, mm -hmm. where we see that the diversity gets better over time. And, I mean, it's still not great. <laughs> There's still a lot of work left to be done, but uh, we are making progress. And I think we're making progress at Drupal cons and how we do speaker selection. I think we make progress on Drupal.org and how we, um, you know, capture information about people. I mean, I think we're working on a lot of great things, and so I want to do more of that. For sure. And then the question is, should it be an official in, um, initiative or not? I think um, if it gets us, if, if it allows us to make more progress faster, then yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think how making it official would give it more, more of that. Maybe it would help. Yeah. Yeah. It's how we how we can see that actually achieving a specific goal, and then yeah. that makes it worthwhile. Thanks, Alana, for the question because I forgot to read out your name. <laughs> Um, we've got an anonymous, anonymous one here. I want to flip back to Drupal for a second and the actual product. Sure. And thinking about that beginner experience as well. So Drupal's been at the top or near the top of the most dreaded web framework according to Stack Overflow surveys. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? It's a huge recognition, actually. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> the fact that we're on that list means everybody knows us. Um, <laughs> but the, the funny thing, actually, if you look at that list, um, it's been a while since I looked, but like we're on the most dreaded list, but we're also on the most loved list, by the way. So it's like you, you know, people love us as well as dread us. Um, and so, I don't know, I think it's a compliment to Drupal. Honestly, it wasn't joking. Um, the fact that we're among those other projects on that list is pretty <laughs> remarkable. Um, and other things that are on the dreaded lists are like, I don't know, I forgot what it was, but like, I, I thought even Linux was on that list, and it's like, really? <laughs> so I've got, I find that list, I don't know, just a list to me. Um, you know, I think we're doing amazing things, and people are doing great things with Drupal, and yeah, it's not for everyone, I think. Um, I think the learning curve, as I mentioned, is a big part of that. Like, you know, it, I mean, people I'll say all the time that the first impression matters. And I think Google's first impression could be a lot better. And so I'm sure there's millions of web developers, actually millions, that have tried Drupal and they've given up. And those are probably many of the people that would say, you know, you're on the dreaded list because I couldn't figure it out. And they blame, they blame Drupal for that, right? Um, it's like the five minute rule, you play with it for five minutes and you make a large impression in that time. Exactly, so I mean, I think it just speaks to, uh, it just makes me more convinced that we need to do the things that I propose we should do, so. Yeah. yeah. I'm not worried about these lists at all, like, uh, we shouldn't doubt what we do because of lists like that. Like, we're growing, we're healthy, so we do see things come up on occasions that, uh, and, and projects that come almost sideways at us that uh, help, try to help with such things. Uh, Seth raised a question around the Gutenberg project. And uh, what are your thoughts on Gutenberg as an editor in terms of improving the experience for beginners to Drupal? But also, how would it fit into the layout builder? Mm, actually, there's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm not an expert on Gutenberg, by the way, just so you know, um, or WordPress. Um, but I, I mean, I think there's good things about it, and I, I think there's some things that maybe aren't great about it. Um, so I mean, I think what, what I like about it is that it's actually easy to use. It's, it's easy. People can build pages fairly quickly, and we should, we should think about what elements of that can we take and implement in Drupal. Uh, but then there's also things that do that we do way better than they do, um, in my mind, like um, accessibility being one of them. Um, um, but also, like, 
um, creating reusable templates and pages. Like Gutenberg is probably good for one-off landing pages, uh, but like in case of Drupal, where sometimes you have hundreds of thousands of product pages, let's say, on your website, or tens of thousands of product pages, you need to create not one page, but you need to create a product template page. And that's some of the things that we really do that relative to, to Gutenberg. Right, so then the question is, what elements of Gutenberg can we take and apply them to, to the layout builder? And um, I think that's what the layout builder team has been doing. Like they've really started to look at um, the user experience of the layout builder. And today, I didn't really talk about it in my keynote um, because I've covered that in the past. But the last time I covered it in my keynote, um, layout builder landed in core. And the layout builder was primarily used for laying out, let's say, content types, right? Um, and, um, you know, we did some user testing on that as well, and people were like, wow, it's a little bit confusing because I want to actually change the menu too, and I want to maybe drag my footer somewhere else. And, but it was only, you can only use the layout builder for like a section of the page, not the whole page. And so now the layout builder team has been doing a lot of work on um, basically taking over the whole page with Layout Builder, right? And so you can literally lay out the whole page and they're doing that in, in sort of the Drupal way where it can be templated and all of these things. So and we're making usability improvements to it too. So I think we're getting better and better. A lot of that is happening in, in Contrib today and hopefully that will make it make its way into Core. Um, so I think we're doing the right things. Uh, and then, you know, Gutenberg and Drupal, um, I was actually talking to them um, last night. Um, the team, I uh, forgot the name of their company right now. Um, Say that again? Frontcom. Yes, Frontcom, yeah. Um, so it's an organization, I think in Sweden or something, in the Nordics, I think. Norway. Norway, yeah. They've been um, basically um, working on making sure Gutenberg works in Drupal. And they've been maintaining that for quite a while and they were saying they do new releases every two weeks and so it seems like that's could be a pretty mature solution actually. Um, so it's definitely I want to go home and check it out again. Um, okay, cool. Because for some use cases that might be great. Yeah. You know, I think I think if you have a website with ten pages, it's fine if every page is kind of a snowflake page, right? Versus if you have ten thousand pages you may need a little bit more <laughs> templating but um, could be a very good solution for Drupal for certain use cases. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why we why we benefit from being so flexible. Right. And, and Matt Mullen, by the way, he texts me once in a while, and he would really love us to use Gutenberg. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's, he built it in a way that should be CMS agnostic. Yeah, and like he's eager for other CMSs to to adopt it, like we're doing. Mm. So you know, it's yeah, open that's source at, it, at its best, right? And, uh, yeah. So I'm going to go a bit kind of offline here and uh, combine two questions together. Um, looking into the future, so something here about Drupal in schools from G. Bowdoin. If he's in the room, ah, hi. We were trying to meet earlier, but we missed each other, so so come see me afterwards because I'm trying to find you. <laughs> um, Drupal in schools. Is there a school or teacher out there using Drupal to teach web creation to yes, kids? There are actually. And um. combine that and look into the future. Where will we be in 2025, 2030? And how does that relate to schools. education? Oh, um, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, there are different professors. Um, that I know of that teach Drupal as part of their curriculum. Um, actually, one of them was on our board, Samir uh, Verma. He teaches, I forgot, is it San Francisco University or something? Yeah. He teaches Drupal at the university. Um, but there's definitely others as well. And so they, I think there's been even some collaboration around the curriculum too. Um, so I don't know the details of that, but it's maybe worth checking out. Um, I, mean, I think. I think it's great when people teach Drupal in schools because obviously it allows um, students to discover Drupal in, in a very structured way and I would imagine they come out uh, being excited about Drupal because again this learning curve thing, <laughs> you, you know, 
I imagine you have to get over a learning curve to pass. <laughs> and so I think teaching that to students is, is, is a great way to get, um, you know, I love it when people in the beginning of their career join the project. There's a, often a level of energy and excitement. Um, and so, yeah, finding these, um, you know, bringing students or, you know, freshly graduated people into the project is exciting to me. Yeah. Oh. So, sticking on a theme of future, how do you see your role and Acquia's role changing in the community? You know, now we've had this new acquisition. Yeah, I don't think that will change much. Um, so, the, the, so I don't know if everybody received this news or not, but like, uh, um, you know, Acquia basically received a major investment from a new investor and you know a lot of that is a rotation of old investors to be honest like some of our early investors have been in the company for 12 years and so at some point they want to return the money to their investors uh, their LPs it's called and so a lot of that is a you know kind of like old investors going out and having a successful exit and a new investor coming in and what's good about that is that usually I mean, always actually, these new investors have a completely fresh time horizon, right? Like they don't need to return the money <laughs> for some time. And they also bring a unique skill set. Like the early stage investors at Acquia, they were specialized in growing, you know, startups from zero to 100 million or something, right? And so now we have investors that are specialized in growing us to a billion dollars. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and that's great. Uh, they also have deeper pockets uh, than the early stage investors. Like the our early start stage investors, they may have a $50 million fund, $50 million that they need to spread over 10 companies or something. These guys have billions of dollars. Um, and you know, when they in you know when they when they wanted to invest, I actually spent a lot of time with them. Um, they love our strategy, what we're doing. They love Drupal. They obviously are not dumb. <laughs> they understand that like 95% of Aquas customers rely on Drupal. And so they really um, are excited about that. Um, and you know, they, they would love to keep investing in Drupal and uh, invest more in Drupal. Um, so I, th I think it's great because Aquia remains um, independent. Uh, Aquia will be Aquia. Our strategy remains unchanged. My role will remain unchanged, and um, we, we get access to more capital, which will allow us to hopefully, um, you know, do more great things. And I think the market in general has, has been interesting. Um, like, you know, there's the big player. Like, I mean, if you think about the market, there's not a lot of small players that have an impact. Like, on the one hand, you have the Wixes and the Squarespaces of the world, completely SaaS-based. They're growing very fast. Um, they're now doing three, four hundred million in revenue, and like growing forty percent year over year. So um, these are not small players, and they're going to eventually probably move up market. Uh, on the other hand, you have the side course and the Adobe's. I mean, Adobe alone in the last five years probably spent seven, eight billion dollars doing acquisitions, just in in like our space, right? Not in like the creative things that they do, but in the in the enterprise software and enterprise marketing space. So I mean, these are big players. And then, you know, even Automatic just raised $300 million from Salesforce. And so I think it's good that Acquia, um, you know, has access to this similar kind of capital. And hopefully others will be able to get that too. Uh, the more the better, but at least Acquia will be able to, you know, to help. So, I'm reading this question from Platico, uh, talking about this year, the World Wide Web celebrated 30 years since it was born. Uh, I remember playing with, I remember the first browser I used, didn't understand JPEG files. <laughs> it was like, you had to download an extension so it understood JPEG, for God's sake. Um, what do you think is the future of the web? Um, I mean, I, I talked a little bit about it in my keynote. I think we're, and I've talked about it actually for the last five years, in a way, but like, I define it as the uh, post-browser web, um, where um, you know things are becoming a lot more complex. 
um, in the sense that, um, as I mentioned, Rux sites aren't standalone applications anymore. There's a lot of integrations, which means there's a lot of data to manage. And there's also a lot of different channels now that customers want to have an experience on. Right? So there's a browser experience, which is important. But now there is you know, smartwatches, and mobile, and email, and digital kiosks, like the, the experience in the New York subway that I referenced. And so in the future is that. Is driving a lot of the screens and, and non-screens like voice and chat uh, all from a single place, and uh, in a way, I don't know. In a way, the web is becoming part of our fabric. It's going to be everywhere, and it's going to be a little bit more invisible while being more present in a way. And so, browsers remain important, but it will be one of many different output channels. Um, and I, I feel like we're in a very good position, actually. To, to kind of, I think we've navigated ourselves to be in a, in a, in a good position. There's a lot more to do um, to really be good at that. Um, and, you know, there's some urgency around that as well, I think. So. Cool. So, well, we've talked a few things about the future and what that might involve. Um, I think one of the best ways of looking forward is also to look backwards and think, what can we learn? Can you share with us any bad decisions or mistakes that have been made in the Drupal core history mm. and what you think you've learned from them? Yeah. Um, let's see. Like, like a bad product decision. Is that yeah. A, um, well, I think so. I any suggestions? Could be anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could be, could it be, could be a great interactive question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of mistakes that we made, I think. Um, trying to think what's a good example. Um, Overlay module. Overlay. Yeah, overlay. <laughs> there we go. I mean, yeah, like we overlay for those, you know, was basically you clicked something that was an overlay and the administration experience was in the overlay. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, we thought that was a good idea and we implemented it and it turned out to be a bad idea, so we removed it again. So, I mean, these things are all, they're all, it's very normal, I think. Like. I don't think there's a single open source project or product organization that doesn't make those kinds of bad decisions. The question is, um, you know, how do you how do you deal with them, right? And so there, I have this I have this thing I call it fail forward, <laughs> um, which is kind of a variant of fail fast. But like, if you fail at something, you tried something, it didn't work. How can you learn from it, and how can you institutionalize that learning? So. You know, I think we have to keep doing these experiments, though. I think we have to keep trying things, not just doing the things that are obviously super safe to do. So, Because we've done a lot of things that really were experimental and worked tremendously in our favor as well. And I'll give, I know I'm kind of twisting the question a little bit, but like, um, you know, like the taxonomy system in the early days of Drupal was, let's, let's call it non-standard, you know? And, but it was very powerful and very complex. And so many people adopted Drupal back in the day, and this is like 2004 era, <laughs> uh, because of that, right? Because we had something that was kind of like special and then a little bit of a, of a bet and an experiment. So experiments are great and we should do more of them, uh, but we should also, we shouldn't be afraid to fail and, and back in mind if they don't work, so. Uh, do you think a telemetry initiative would help with that? Yes, I mean, yeah, so, can you repeat the yeah, so the question was, do you think the telemetry initiative can help with that? And so let me kind of explain that a little bit. So, uh, so one of the things that we don't have in Drupal is good data on how people use Drupal, right? Like, we just don't know. And so the telemetry initiative is really meant to, you know, instrument Drupal, the product, so we can see uh, as the developer community, we can see which modules are actually being used and which modules are not being used. Uh, but even go deeper than that, and not just at the module level, but even at the feature level. Like um, we were talking about this actually, um, we had a core committer retrospective, and um, I think it was Alex actually that suggested like we have multiple admin feeds, or we have a feature that allows organizations to switch the admin feed, right? 
And it's actually creating a lot of overhead because we need to make sure every theme works as an admin team. And so that's a lot of testing, and we're like, how many people actually use that? How many people actually switch their admin theme? And would we be better off removing it? Because then we could go faster on other things, right? So it's a good question, and, and frankly, we don't have the answer. And, we, and if we had the telemetry initiative, we could say, you know, for the next six months, let's actually try and measure how many people change that. We can use data to then decide, all right, it's worth keeping this initiative, this feature, or we're just gonna back it out because it simplifies the experience, it simplifies the maintenance, and it reduces a lot of overhead in the development and testing cycle as well. So I'm a huge fan of this telemetry initiative. Obviously, we would need to build it the right way. You know, questions around data privacy and, and these kinds of things very quickly come to mind, but um, obviously, we can work around those things and we can be smart about how we do things, but uh, it's actually something that we hope to, to do and we need the Drupal Association for that as well because, <laughs> I mean, adding the telemetry in Drupal is probably easy, uh, but it's like capturing all of the data at the scale of Drupal and then processing and managing the data and making it available so we can analyze it. I think that's where the hard work is. So. Um, it would be great to work on that with the Drupal Association. It would be an exciting project. Yeah. But I, sorry, go ahead. No, no I was actually going to say we're out of time, and I think actually it's, finishing on listening okay. as a concept is actually a good, good place to finish. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dries. Yeah. I I know you get a lot of kind of hard questions in this, and you just sat there not knowing what they're going to be. Right. So we really do appreciate it. Did you so, skip the hard ones though? No, 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 I kind of went for the hard ones here and there. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. If anybody uh, wants me to add them to the uh, project as, a, as an issue recognition for their question, please just give us a shout now and I'll add it. Yeah. <laughs>